Okay, we're back to Sherlock Holmes and the case of the rosed tattoo. What is up on top of the desk? Is it? Oh, it's a directory. Couldn't remember. Oh, hold on. Okay. We should be... There we go. Numerous bits of paper, a useless diary, and while well, that's already been talked about. This annually published volume is the most recent installment of Kelly's Post Office Directory. For a small fee to the listee, it provides addresses of private residences and commercial establishments in Greater London. All right, let's go. Take your pistol, oh. will you, Watson? There's no telling what this case will bring. For once I am ahead of you, Holmes. It is in my pocket. Ooh, we have Pistola. We have to change into the correct attire. There we go. Let's get our Sherlock outfit on. Uh-huh. Yep. Okay. Small, regularly shaped stones, when cast by a practiced hand, produce a distinctive sound. These are soldiers in Wigan's signal system. <clears throat> What's the banner say? The banner touts the lead story of the Sun's current edition. The vendor has paid a stipend to display it. When a titillating or a salacious headline is unavailable, the text adheres to the sensationalist maxim, If it bleeds, it leads. My compliments, Mr. Rigby. The early bird gets the worm, what? Uh, news don't wait on the slug a bit, Mr. Holmes. I'm sorry about your brother's misfortune. Government can't afford the loss. What are his prospects, sir, if I might ask? His condition is guarded. Your concern is appreciated. Well, uh, the best of British luck to him. And pardon the banner, I'm obliged to display it. You must make a living, Jonas, as must be all. All right, let's go to the city. Of course, this is... <clears throat> I recently played a game that probably won't be up yet when I put this one up. Let's see here. We need to go back to the police. See if we can't weasel anything out of them. Since we know more than they do right now about what really happened. Hello, Augie. Anything doing? Not enough. Give people what they want and where's the thanks. But... I oh, forget me manners. Condolences on your brother's demise. Your expression is premature. Mycroft is alive. Oh, but near death, surely. I have it on the best authority. Your source is impeachable. Demand a refund. <laughs> it's not correct. What more have you heard about the Diogenes Club explosion? A working stiff don't have time for idle chatter, Mr. Holmes. Even surmise or as a price. On principle, I never purchase information. Perhaps you can suggest how we might overcome this scruple. Indeed, I can. Ante up a shilling and we'll play a little free card Monty for the tidbit. Best two out of three. You win, the info's free. Lose, it's yours for ten bob. Eh? Contrary to the adage, Augie, the hand is not always quicker than the eye. Yours is prosecutably slow. Have a heart. Keep it to yourself. Here's a nugget. Two hard Irish lads was in the city, both of them familiar with the niceties of Jellignite and mean enough to use it. Trashing a fancy English club might just suit their fancy. Names? Ooh. Whereabouts? No names. Precursor to Suppose IRA. I tell the police that this game has never been on the square and that you've nicked them all. No need to get violent. 
I heard those boyos was looking for a party name of uh, Boyd something. A coal miner, I heard. That's all I got, I swear. That may be what the police call a lead. I have to be somewhat more discriminating. Okay, constable time. Let's see if he has anything different. It is different. The sign convincingly demonstrates how unimaginative the police can be. The idea that a sane, that sane person, suffragettes, and politicians notwithstanding would willingly hang about such a dreary place is preposterous on its face. Holding cells here house two classes of detainees, prisoners in transit to Bow Street and those poor souls awaiting removal to the lunatic ward at St. Mary's. Whether an urban dog holds its master in higher regard than this homely object is debatable. This hydrant is one of a dozen in the city. Eventually their profilation will eliminate the fire brigade's need to carry its own water. This enclosed wagon is used to transport prisoners. In Ireland, such vehicles are called Black Marias because they've been used to carry off merely suspicious civilians to uncertain destinations. This aggressively unattractive pile houses the Criminal Investigation Division, which is comprised of the less dim-witted and self-important layabouts from the entire force. One hopes the new headquarters will be less dismal. Oh, Holmes. Scotland Yard refers to the grounds of the castle that formerly stood here to house Scots royalty when they came to London. The name is popularly used to refer to the CID and Metropolitan Police Headquarters. Augie is cut out between the underworld and the police. Officially, he deals in notions and runs a game of chance. Unofficially, he sells or trades tidbits of what he is pleased to call confidential information to both sides. He lives by his wits. It's not a good living. <laughs> no, look. Constable Burns has been assigned to door duty for nearly a year. This is not a harbinger of career advancement. His humorless intellect suits his dull duties. He often wiles away the tedium by serving as Augie's mark. Municipal architecture is the most depressing art form known to man. You don't approve of the design? The builder tried to convey solidity. Better he should have died in the attempt. Oh. What he achieved is merely ponderous when it's not positively oppressive. I'll take that as a no, shall I? <laughs> Holmes. A quiet watch, Constable? As I prefer it, Mr. Holmes. I'd like a word with Lestrade. You're not alone, sir. But the inspector is engaged. And he's left particular orders not to be disturbed, even by you. Really? Is Augie still schooling you at Three Card Monte? The man's an unnatural wizard. I never win. I swear he could retire to Blackpool on the brass he's taken off me. It's a mugs game, Constable. But nobody wins all the time. <laughs> you want to know the secret to Augie's success? Only slightly less than the Ripper's real name. Might I see Lestrade on the strength of it? The door is yours. Once inside, you're on your own hook. Fine. After Augie manipulates the cards, tell him to move away from the table. Say that if your card is not one of those face down, he's in for a stay at Pentonville. I guarantee you'll start to recoup some of your losses. He's been bombing a card, then. Some secrets are just too tawdry to tell, Constable. <laughs> that got us in. <laughs> Persons whose business cannot be summarily concluded are asked to take a seat. Experienced men, with the liberty to do so, flee at that moment knowing that these instruments of torture masquerading as chairs have caused a sizable fraction of the city's cases of lumbago. A neatly put together old deer nods knowingly and mumbles in the general direction of no one in particular. She is a regular visitor at the yard. A family relationship with Lestrade has been suggested. She makes no eye contact as she carries on a private coll colloquy with unknown beings or forces. 
Victoria, Queen of the United Kingdom and Empress of India, is the 53rd year of her reign. In this picture, she wears her golden jubilee gown. Tobias Gregson, his eye always fixed on career advancement, spends his leisure reviewing open cases. He devotes special attention to those handled by Inspector Lestrade. Unbridled ambition may lead to unfortunate consequences. The constabulary spend more time writing up cases than investigating them. That is, that this dubious contribution to protecting the British way of life goes largely unrecognized and unappreciative may be instructive. The desk sergeant assigns cases to constables, controls access to inspectors, and fields inquiries from the rare private party who penetrates these portals. The sergeant is high priest of the yard, and the duty desk is his altar. The desk sergeant catalogs physical evidence from current crimes and temporarily stores it here. This advance in police procedure guarantees the integrity of evidence should it, the need for it arise in a criminal prosecution. The evidence, of course, is only as good as the collector of the same. A well-dressed young woman commands Lestrade's attention. Her gestures declare her distress. Nevertheless, her voice is nearly inaudible as she pours out her apparent endless tale of woe. The inspector appears fixed to his chair by the energy of the young woman who addresses him. Much police work has little to do with crime prevention and public safety. The duty officers daily plod through a mountain of wearisome paperwork, and this was in the 1800s. Portraits of some of London's most despicable, despicable, despicable ugh, mm, villains are prominently displayed. Struggling to talk. It's good. I'm glad I'm doing this. This is. You can tell that for about a year or so we didn't. I didn't do much. I needed to be able to enunciate again. Every local police station has a decent working library. The yard possesses, in addition to the buckram-bound collections of resolved cases and abstruse legal treaties, volumes devoted to special subjects like bloodstains, and a recent edition of the Great Encyclopedia Britannica. The, this distressed person awaits transportation to the lunatic ward at St. Mary's. The police surmise that his erratic behavior may turn violent. That conclusion might be premature. He loses his breath during his rantings and his complexion alters. All right, here we go. Sergeant, might I have a word with Inspector Lestrade? You might, Mr. Holmes, if he were free, but as you see, he's not. Dissipating his meager talents on trivialities, no doubt. You'd know best. If you wish to wait, you may take a seat. Awarded the Victoria Cross for conspicuous bravery during the Sepoy Mutiny, Master Sergeant Jeremy Duncan controls the station with crisp efficiency and unquestioned authority. His formal bearing belows a harmless affection for idle chatter and slanderous gossip. Sergeant, has the elderly female party become a permanent fixture? You might say, Mr. Holmes. She used to char here. Now she thinks we're guests in her parlor. Haven't the heart to disabuse her. Oh. When might Lestrade be available, Sergeant? I couldn't say, sir. He's been burning his ear for a longer spell and shows no sign of weakening. I got tongue lashed for interrupting. What's her problem? Claims her brother's being wrongfully detained. Clap doodle, of course. But the inspector's going the extra mile. There have been allegations of high handedness. He may see Gregson looking over his shoulder if you take my meaning. Hmm. Let's see here. Let's just be nice. How's the family, Sergeant? Down with the grip, Mr. Holmes. Terrible Ooh. cramps. I'm far from tip-top myself. Sorry to hear it. Might I speak with Inspector Gregson? Of course. And might I say, sir, how sorry I am about your brother. It's out of human hands, isn't it? Terrible business, these gas explosions. Yes, thank you, Sergeant. I'll just pop over to Gregson. Mr. Holmes, Doctor, what can I do for you? 
Well, about the news. Has there been any news concerning the fire at the Diogenes? The brigade confirmed our suspicions, sir. A spark of unknown origin ignited a gas main. The explosion was a regrettable accident. What is regrettable, Inspector, is that the brigade doesn't possess the brain power to perform simple logic. As long as the cause of the spark remains unknown, the ultimate cause of the fire cannot be otherwise. Very true. You credit the Does Lestrade have anything to add to the brigade's report? Doubtful. He has several cases running and was eager to close the book on this one. Typical. Always the easy way. Well, he's not as acute as he was, and compassion is not a strong point, but our workload is quite overwhelming. If the man is overworked, let him say so. Platitudes merely mask incompetence and lack of imagination. The callous numbskull. Good Holmes, Lord, Holmes. Moderate your tone. Yeah. Well spoken, Mr. Holmes, if you'll permit me to say so. Can you give me authority to investigate this Diogenes business? That I can't, Mr. Holmes, and it pains me to deprive you, but Lestrade is in charge. I can't interfere, I'm sorry. Do you credit the rumor that Irish hooligans are abroad in the city? If you are suggesting that terrorists are behind the Diogenes explosion, Mr. Holmes, I can't encourage you. What if there were evidence of a bomb having been ignited? If you have such evidence, I want to see it. I'd want to know where it was found and why it was not turned over to the office. But I believe there is no such evidence. The Diogenes is not their sort of target. Tell that to my brother. I think that's enough, Holmes. Police bureaucracy is perfectly suited for certain types of work. What types are those, Holmes? The tedious, the repetitive, the fatuous, the unimaginative, and the squalid. As that <laughs> covers God. most criminal activity, it's a wonder you stay busy. Drop the sarcasm, Doctor. I'm determined to be angry with the police. If I am unreasonable, I expect you to humor me. You appear discomfited, Watson. Is there a problem? Do not concern yourself, Holmes. The draft is wreaking havoc on my sinuses. Simply makes me feel more thick-headed than usual. Hmm. May a patient's maladies be diagnosed from their ravings? A specialist might be able to. I'll wager alcohol plays a part in this episode. Is it current drink, a history of abuse, or a seizure? Hmm. It's a fair question. Note the particularity of his tics and gyrations. Mm, they are suggestive. And the alterations of his complexion. An even better observation. I have been as previous as the police. The man is ill, some form of epilepsy perhaps. I don't want help. <laughs> I've already figured it out anyway. Yep. Sergeant, I believe your prisoner is ill. There's no doubt about it, Mr. Holmes. Mentally defunct, I'd say. Criminally insane. No telling what he'll get up to on the loose. I think not. He's an epileptic. Dr. Watson will support my observation. Well, I'm loath to contradict you, Mr. Holmes. But you'll say so, just don't cut it in this instance. The bloke's loopy. Huh. Let's try Dr. Watson again. I know that's what you got to do. How can we talk to the brute and not get arrested, Watson? We can wait and watch our hair turn gray or help his current victim along. Ooh, telephone. No, not the desk sergeant, the telephone. The Metropolitan Police have used telephones for nearly 10 years, mainly for communicating amongst themselves. Most right-thinking people regard the instrument as an intrusive nuisance. I uh, feel that way about... Sergeant, are you familiar <laughs> the with the Encyclopedia Britannica? The greatest collection of bulk learning on earth, my dear pal, we said. That's as may be. I believe its articles on medicine are considered authoritative. 
Next to God, they're all the truth there is, sir. I said so. If you'd like to save the inspector's reputation from careening downhill and protect the yard from litigation for unlawful arrest, you should know of the latest research on epilepsy. Pay special attention to the sections on grand mal and psychomotor seizures. That man is sick. Jensen, the man in the lockup may be epileptic. Look up grand mal seizures in the EB and convey your findings to Inspector Lestrade. Right away, Sarge. Incarcerated gentleman cleaned up immediately and release him to his sister's custody. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Another scandal here would be damaging. Oh, we got it. Okay. He's already being a smart ass. You're finally ready to resume your duties, Lestrade? I appreciate your assistance on that medical matter, Mr. Holmes. But the arch tone is out of order. What can I do for you? Evidently nothing, even though there is more to the Diogenes disaster than the pathetic official examination has divulged. Suspicions are your trade, Mr. Holmes. Proof pays the bills in police business. Proof? I'll give you proof. If your people... We wondered, Inspector, if... I'm perfectly capable of speaking for myself, Watson. Yeah, but you're just a little pissy. <laughs> okay. If you won't investigate the explosion further, you might at least assist me. How? Give me carte blanche at the explosion site and the morgue. Something sinister is going on, Lestrade, if only you had the wit to see it. I will ignore the insult in deference to your fragile emotional state. If you want to waste your time, I won't stop you. Okay. But you'll excuse me if I don't squander my department's resources to gratify your overdeveloped and theoretic suspicions. <laughs> Without well-founded supposition, Lestrade, reason staggers and the mind dies. You might remember that. <laughs> okay. Holmes is a little bit of a bitch. <laughs> I'm sure he'll have different opinions. Most of this pile of rubbish came from the members' lounge, whether this is due to the fire being hottest there, or because the lounge contained most of the club's furniture is unclear. The bleached, though unburned wood suggests a blaze of extraordinary heat. Certain types of explosions cause flash fires with such properties. Yeah, he's already figured it out. This pot is chipped and cracked and partially filled. Okay, he said the same thing. A torch provides considerable illumination for those charged with maintaining security. The fire brigade presumably turned off the gas in the immediate era after the explosion, you'd hope. Hold on, I don't want to do that yet. Forbes, I'd like to go inside. Please assist me. Until further notice, sir, the club is closed to members and guests. I'm not impossible. Only authorized representatives of the constabulary are allowed inside. What are you playing at? You deluded martinet, you... you... Your attitude is deplorable, Forbes, but I suppose I must oblige you. 
should have permission. Grudgingly given, Lestrade's note does no more than misstate the obvious. It will, nevertheless, suffice for those persons who are intimidated or otherwise impressed by official stationery. It reads, Mr. Holmes is reviewing the facts of the gas explosion at the Diogenes Club. Please extend your cooperation. G. Lestrade, Chief Inspector, Scotland Yard. I'll honor the inspector's request. The Yard, CID and all. Respect for authority is the cornerstone of civilization. Must maintain discipline. Would have preferred a personal appeal. Indeed, I'll tell him you felt slighted. He's sure to be mortified. Did you happen to spy any suspicious persons lurking about earlier? I tolerate no loitering on my watch, Mr. Holmes. Members don't like it. If I so much as sniff a tradesman, I move them along sharpish. Forbes, what happened after the explosion? Did you notice anything unusual? I was stunned. Not myself for a few moments. You saw no one on the street when you revived? No one except yourselves. My brother wondered if the fire brigade might have missed anything. Nothing, Mr. Holmes. You've come in vain. Any items or circumstances that seem not in accord with a gas explosion? The brigade is satisfied that there's no evidence to the contrary. Any odd or personal effects discovered? No. Nothing of a private nature has been removed from the club. I'm sworn to protect members' property and I will perform my duty. Uh -huh. Let's not tarry, Forbes. We'll go in now. I warn you that it's dark and nasty inside. That suits my mood down to the ground. <laughs> and I remind you, touch nothing. Uh, well, that's not gonna happen. Touch lots of things. Oh, yep, this is uh, definitely different. The club's founders are commemorated in oil. Brigadier Hastings, the tactician. Sir Wingate Colfide, the naturalist lately consumed by an obscure Caledonian tribe, and Mycroft Holmes. It is a cruel twist that Mycroft's image was less severely damaged than the man himself. A room is nearly leveled while a fragile cart survives as a proof of disaster's cap <laughs> capricious character. This elegant tortoiseshell snuff box is uncommonly like one Mycroft purchased for a ridiculous sum from a posh Mayfair shop in 1885. The box contains a few grains of what might be finely ground snuff. I've asked you not to touch club property. Put that back, if you please. Forbes, my brother's snuff box is not included in your purview. Do not make yourself an unbearable nuisance. You can even see water dripping off the back there. That's pretty cool. Still the haze, too. That's very interesting. The heavy oak doors that opened to the lounge probably saved Mycroft's life. They were, of course, blown away, but they absorbed, dissipated, and redirected much of the explosion's terrible force. The walnut cabinet of the grandfather clock has been a marred, has been marred and pitted by a variety of flying debris. Some of the missiles collided with such force that they are stuck in the wood like tines in a potato. This once charming memorial female is now as unrecognizable as she was unknown. The debate occasioned by her acquisition was very heated. Some members will mark her destruction as a sign of divine retribution. Others will regret her passing. Most won't notice her absence. No, don't. Don't leave. 
The likeness is irreparably damaged. The irony of possessing a bust of one of history's greatest orators is presumably lost on those club members who hold all speech to be a pernicious modern convention. Good dialogue in this game. Among the splintered glass, broken spindles, and severed chains that form the clockworks, medium-sized brass handle looks out of place. Touch nothing, Mr. Holmes. I'll have to charge your brother an assessment. Hmm... Before its violent separation from the case to which it was attached, this handle covered with crocodile skin complemented a fine gladstone bag. One maker in Sheffield manufactures thousands one maker in Sheffield manufactures thousands of similar handles yearly. You didn't have a problem with that? Uh, what do your feline orbs spy? Watson, what do your feline orbs spy? Hmm. Outlines, Holmes. No real details. The smoke plays tricks with the light. Oh, wow. B.A.T. Masterson acquired this runner on one of his lightning expeditions to Constantinople. The popular press has been highly critical of the commercial ends towards which the diplomat has used his vaunted negotiating skills. Member of the brigade has left an act and embedded into the cloakroom's door. Small table and chair take up much of the cloakroom space. Broken tea things litter the floor. Brother. Oh, I don't know what he just said because I clicked through it. Okay. Has anyone worked on the gas lines in the last day or so? Checked and bled by Midlands last week. All in perfect order. Like Inspector Lestrade says. Gas accidents are the price of progress. Depend on Lestrade for a cliché in lieu of exercising his brain. The Lectio Facilior is fine for paleography, but it won't do for logic. The man's reasoning powers are abysmal. Forbes, who relieves you when you're away from your post? Always on duty, Mr. Holmes. The members have given me a room of my own. Don't be obtuse. Surely you have bodily functions to attend to, tea breaks and so on? I leave for a minute or two during the day. I have my elevenses and tea at 4.30, with members' permission. Did any strangers enter the club in the afternoon? No one escapes my eye, Mr. Holmes. After the late post, a few guests arrived and left. All perfectly respectable gentlemen. I'm sure they were, Forbes. Were any of them carrying a valise or a large package, anything of that sort? Certainly not. The Diogenes don't cater to commercial travelers. I send them packing. Let's see here. This fellow is too eager to assert his authority, Watson. He's as willful as a mule, but not as smart. I wouldn't mind taking him down a peg if the opportunity arose. If Forbes continues to be obstructive, Watson, will you distract him? With pleasure. We can't have him hovering. Listen for my sign. I'll start jabbering incoherently. But how will I recognize the sign, Holmes? I just said... Oh, very amusing, Watson. Very droll. <laughs> Watson got one over on you. All right.
Was your clock face near the grandfather, Watson? It was, Holmes. How did you guess? You know my methods, Doctor. I do not guess. I observe. I deduce. Anything of significance, Watson? Not that I can see, which isn't much. I'd like more of what you found, or your skill in finding it. I wouldn't call it skill, Holmes. It was dumb luck. Most men's modesty is a sham or an excuse, Doctor. Your modesty becomes you. Not unexpectedly, the members' lounge was as devastated by the concussive force of the explosion as by the fire that resulted from it. The adjacent stranger's room has virtually disappeared. The fire brigade's efforts have caused extensive water damage. Several feet of brass chain hang forlornly from the ceiling. The explosion violently separated the chandelier that was suspended from it. The lighting fixtures lay in ruins before the fireplace. Though visibility is restricted, an intriguing mass of rubble and paper debris may be discerned. Pieces of stone and wood deny access to the pile. Lacking illumination, access isn't worth much, and it can be dangerous. The impenetrable heap confines access to only the most pedestrian use of the explosion's refuse. Mr. Holmes, I've told you, touch nothing. Watson, do you have a bullseye? It's as dark as a rent collector's heart over here. I don't have mine, Holmes. Battery's gone. What do you need? I'd like to shed some light on the situation rather than curse the darkness. No, it's not what I need. And I have the lamp. An immense support beam appears to be kind of linchpin for the accumulated debris. I could move it with my shoulder, but it's not worth being crushed by the falling rubble. Let's see if that'll get him going. Come, Watson, let's carry on. If we must, Holmes. This is a deuced gloomy place. These timbers must be hewn. I'm no lumberjack, Holmes, and we have no saw. There's more than one way to fell a tree. I didn't even see the leather chair earlier. Sir Hubert oh, Fortescue's favorite chair was upended and wet, abandoned for the first time in recent memory. Its leather may still bear his body imprint. Watson, might I have a word? What is it, Holmes? Do you see a way to dislodge that particular beam without loss of life or limb? Hmm. Remove it from a distance. But Forbes will be unhappy if you interfere with that pile. Then he must be distracted. Watson, I was just thinking of that embalmed armadillo. Do tell, Holmes. The military implications <coughs> are momentous. Impenetrable armor plating, low to the ground indefatigable diggers. Perhaps they could be bred larger and taught to fire a cannon. I'll get on to the War Department, shall I? You might analyze the shelves. Was the destruction of the book selective or random, based on Babbage's principle of non-discriminating violent action? Uh, as you say, Holmes. 
Excellent, Watson. Excellent. Just a moment, Doctor. I'll superintend your activity. Mr. Holmes appears to have gone daft. <laughs> oh. easy enough and inventory The pile of timber and stone is immovably wedged. A metallic glint sparkles through the ash beneath and beyond the impassable mass, and it could be dangerous. Here's the little darling. Unexpected and therefore most interesting. But an expert would find it even more illuminating. The metallic gleam was not a trick of light. Its source was a small spring. So we got... White carbon ash and a chemical residue are fused to the spring which is attached to a ratchet wheel and post. Millions of identical mechanisms wind small alarm clocks. An expert might detect more detailed significance. AKA part of a bomb or timer. Something of that. Well, we got everything we needed out of here. When we get out of here, I'll end this video. I know this one was a little longer, but this is a long game. I believe we exhausted the possibilities of this location, Watson. I hope that you have taken more away from here than I. The fumes are making me woozy. Meh. I got what I wanted, Forbes. well-crafted walnut pedestal lately supported a bust of the club's namesake and one of those random acts that typify disaster this relatively fragile item is undamaged while the marble that sat on it was ravaged even before it fell yeah diogenes the club's eponymous inspiration disregarded conventional comforts slept in a bathtub and spent his daylight hours lantern in hand vainly pursuing an honest man this parian marble rendering of the greek philosopher is irreparably battered yeah, he was murdered in that bathtub, too. I hope you're satisfied. You'd be the last to know, Forbes. Ooh, what's he have to say about the, uh... He doesn't. Okay. Alright, well, on that note... We will save our game. And we will continue here next time and continue back to the hospital and check on Mycroft, perhaps. So, stay tuned for part four. Bye, everybody.